Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We are so excited for today's event. I am, you know, um, having the chance to talk to some of the speakers from today. I can tell you are in for an amazing, delightful experience. Um, with that, I wanted to start with just sharing the agenda for today and um, give you some brief tips on how to uh, engage with us using this platform, and then we'll kick it off. So basically, the agenda is that We'll start with uh, Xavier Walker, who's the president of the Kiwi Leaders Network, uh, sharing brief remarks. And then we'll move to essentially Jeremy, uh, Jeremy from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, who is the Consul General to Los Angeles uh, to give his brief remarks. Then we'll move to um, our first speaker, which is Zian Armstrong, uh, at, uh, uh, who will you know, give us his remarks and we'll share uh, his background journey and advice. And uh, we'll then switch over to uh, our next speaker, Dale, and I uh, will uh, have the same kind of session there. And then at the end, we'll basically have both speakers in a um, fireside, fireside chat dialogue with each other. And that'll be the conclusion of the event. Uh, as uh, for Q&A, we'd love for you to type the Q&A in the platform in itself. You can see there's a Q&A um, icon at the bottom. Feel free to use that to type your questions. We'll use that at the end to pick from uh, those questions and make sure we get uh, you some answers from our wonderful speakers. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Xavier. Just a little bit that I can tell you about Xavier. Uh, he has been one of the most important mentors in my life from us for a very long time. I think it's been like now 15 years. I still consider Xavier as the one person I turn to every time I need advice. Uh, we met during the med, uh, medical school. He was the president of the New Zealand Medical Student Association, no surprises there, and uh, uh, basically um, forced me to take on some roles so I can like help with like um, some of the work in the international medical student uh, domain. Um, but it was one of the best experiences of my life and has carried on uh, building the kind of relationship we have. He also encouraged me to come to the US, which is where I am now. Um, and he will tell you like at some point he tried to get me to stay as a doctor. I'm currently not. That the one area Xavier you have failed at so far, but everything else I'm on track with the trajectory you've laid out for me. Um, but yeah, he's a phenomenal person and I can't, I'm really excited to introduce Xavier Walker, the president of KV Leaders Network to kick off this event. All right. Can can people hear me okay? Let's see. Can you see me okay, Dev? On the yes. screen? Okay, great. Um, thanks for everybody for tuning in. Um, this is our first webinar, so uh, bear with us with a few technical difficulties, but um, it's just great to be with you here at this time and uh, just acknowledge, um, uh, you know, we've got people both in the US and, and New Zealand and uh, just acknowledge uh, different difficulties in, in, the, in the States with uh, COVID and I uh, just appreciate everybody getting time uh, together in this important time. Kiwi Leadership Network, as USA, has been going on for a couple of years now. We're a 513 three uh, non-profit and our really goal is to help New Zealanders succeed and uh, we do different uh, events, uh, networking events, um, inspiring events, um, online resources and interviews and also we're looking to set up a scholarship fund uh, later this year. Uh, we've had a few events in the States, our last one was at Google YouTube where we did a day conference and we've also had events at the embassy. Um, we, had, we ran a COVID series last year um, where there were difficulties there. And this year, obviously, we're moving more into online base. So this is our first webinar. Super excited for the people we have on board. So thanks, uh, Zion and uh, Dow and Jeremy for, for uh, supporting us. And we hope to have more webinars this year and also a virtual conference. So super excited from that. Um, just feel free to put a uh, type in the, in the Q&A. Um, this is all about, um, you know, helping us, everybody in the, in the New Zealand uh, US community. Um, and we look forward to bringing you more of this soon. Uh, my email is xavier at kiwileaders.org. So always feel free to drop me a line, always open and always keen to have people involved. Uh, you can join for free at kiwileaders.org. We're on LinkedIn, we have a LinkedIn group and on Facebook. And uh, yeah, we're just really about making it happen. So just any feedback is, is, is really um, appreciated. We work very closely with the New Zealand US um, uh, organizational community. So I really wanna thank them for their support and help for advertising. Uh, Leslie T uh, Tilly at uh, uh, Kiwi in San Francisco and Cure USA. 
uh, Jackie and Vaughan at Kiwis in LA, Celeste and Kiwis in OC. Um, I want to thank Jordan Small and Lise Grice for with the uh, New Zealand US Business Council, Kia with uh, Tony Truslov, and finally the consulate and the New Zealand uh, Embassy. So we couldn't do it without you. We're all about working uh, together. So I just would love on that note to uh, in introduce a good friend of ours, uh, Jeremy uh, Clark Watson, uh, who is consulate general to Los Angeles. Jeremy has had a stellar career, um, a very experienced diplomat. Um, before this role, he was um, working with a special envoy uh, for the Commonwealth uh, Trade Mission. He has been ambassador to Qatar, has a wealth of experience, um, and he leads a team that is just dynamic to work with um, and been a great supporter for us for many years. Um, and uh, so without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Jeremy uh, Clark Watson to say a few words. Uh, look, thanks, uh, Xavier and, and Divya as well. And uh, kia ora tato, everyone. Um, Xavier, I think you're in the wrong career. You should actually be a diplomat for, for that very kind introduction. Uh, you know, uh, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, everyone, it's great to see you today. Uh, I just wanted to give you a bit of a sense of what we in the consulate are doing here on the West Coast uh, of America. And obviously, as you know, we're linked in very heavily with uh, the embassy and the team in, in Washington, DC, uh, who we who we walk, work to, uh, but we're also linked into the team in New York City and, uh, and also Honolulu. Plus, we have uh, a seconded uh, New Zealand uh, NZTE, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise staff member in San Francisco. So it's a, it's a pretty broad uh, New Zealand Inc. network that we have here in North America. The consulate team, uh, we're really focused on doing all we can to support our interests here on the West Coast. So I cover everything from Alaska through to Wyoming and Montana and down to New Mexico. So it's quite a, quite a swathe of territory. And what that territory includes is some really exciting and positive uh, new areas of collaboration for New Zealand. Uh, it's hugely important for us for trade, for our people to people links, for our educational links. Um, and so we're gonna be looking uh, over the next few years as to how we can really grow and strengthen the networks that we have here on the West Coast. Uh, you all know the story of why America matters uh, to us. It's a $12.5 billion bilateral relationship. We've got hundreds of New Zealand companies uh, that are trading here. Many are based here. Uh, you know, New, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, for example, their demand for support uh, from new companies has gone up 40% over the last year, despite the pandemic. And that puts us in a really good place as we start to move forward. One of my key tasks and the key task of the team here is around that trade advocacy and support that we have for New Zealand uh, here on the West Coast, ensuring that we're engaging you know, with the right people to really push New Zealand's interests, particularly as a committed and open trading nation in the Indo-Pacific region. We've had a really good few years for New Zealand trade policy. We're seeing some headwinds now. Obviously, there's COVID has brought on a, a time of protectionism, uh, increased tariffs that we're facing in particular markets, and some challenges. So we're working with our friends and partners uh, here on the West Coast to really try and advocate for New Zealand, uh, to advocate for new opportunities for our firms and, and for our uh, more open and engaged trade policy. And I think that's a, a really important part of this network and engaging with people such as yourselves uh, who may be able to help us, to connect us to the right people. I think you know, using those networks uh, is, is such a crucial step forward for the New Zealand government over the next few years. And I'm really keen to do more and to, to tap into to you and uh, everyone who's in this group uh, for your support and, uh, and engagement over the, over the coming period. We're also doing a lot of work around investment uh, you know, into New Zealand. It's hugely important. We've got staff looking after the Investor Migrant Program. Uh, which has contributed significantly to the New Zealand economy over the past few years. We're starting to do some work thinking around how can we use that more effectively uh, to help grow, for example, New Zealand's manufacturing capability? How can we use that to push into new industries, particularly around sustainability? And I think that's something that in due course, I'll be keen to hear more from this network over. We're also then thinking about what those new areas are. Obviously, sustainability is a huge area for us, uh, hugely important to the government. You would have seen the prime minister uh, really uh, encouraging New Zealand to think about how we retool our economy and, and think for the next decade on what the sustainability story means. The tech sector, the creative sector, really uh, valuable uh, new growth industries for us, along with aerospace. And we all know the Rocket Lab story, but beyond that, there's a number of New Zealand firms uh, that are doing fantastic work here in the United States. 
I'd highlight a recent collaborative uh, agreement signed by Maxar, which is based in Colorado uh, with the MB in New Zealand, the Ministry of Business, Employment and Innovation, and New Zealand universities to work on geospatial uh, mapping, on drones, uh, on space technology, on weather. Uh, and that's a really great new area of R&D that brings us uh, engagement with our universities. So there's a lot going on. We've got a big team here, uh, both from New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. We've got New Zealand Customs Service, who helps exporters. Uh, we've got ourselves in the foreign, uh, the MFAT team, the foreign mission team, and we really just want to work with all of you and reach out and engage with you. And I think uh, it's really important to set the stage there today because with uh, with Zion and Dale, uh, who are going to be uh, speaking to you next, it's just examples of the value that New Zealanders have here in the United States and the strength uh, that they bring, their business relationships, uh, their knowledge of social networks, and who uh, we can engage with more effectively uh, to do more and help New Zealand grow. So Xavier, congratulations to you and Divya for bringing this together today. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope to see many more of you uh, in person over the course of the year and beyond as, uh, as things start to improve. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for, for those kind remarks and just reminding us how much uh, you know, New Zealand is such a tight community, uh, not only in the business sense, but also how our, our governments are helping businesses here grow. So it's it's amazing to see that uh, bilateral um, exchange. So with that, I really wanted to um, introduce our first uh, speaker for today. I am super excited that we have Zion Armstrong here. Zion is the president of Adidas North America and oversees the business in the US and Canada and is responsible for driving the vision and culture. His successful history with Adidas spans over 20 years and many countries, including New Zealand, Germany, South Korea, Hong Kong, in August 2014, Zion moved to Portland, Oregon, which is the home to Adidas North American headquarters and joined Adidas North America as its brand director. In June 2015, he was appointed as general manager of Adidas North America. And since 2016, Zion has um, become the part of the global Adidas core leadership group that works closely with the Adidas executive board. Zion is a former elite athlete, having completed in the IIAF World Junior Championships and the Commonwealth Games and is a former New Zealand record holder for 400 meter hurdles. Born and raised in New Zealand, Zion is one of 10. He has six sisters and three brothers. Zion is two kids and lives in Portland, Oregon. And I hope you can all agree he is super accomplished and we are just so delighted to have him here. So welcome Zion. Um, so Zion, Wanted to ask you to kick it off with just telling us a little bit more about the your background and painting a little bit more story there. What brought you here and anything you want to start us off with? Yeah, the first thing I want to say, I started with Adidas when I was 10 years old, because, you know, when you say 20 years plus, you're aging me very quickly. Uh, but just just so fortunate mm -hmm. having had the opportunity to work in four continents now, you know, from very humble beginnings. Um, uh, I was born in Otara, uh, raised in West Auckland. Um, I uh, had, had the luxury of actually going through diversity before I even knew it, you know, living in, um, in Massey, West Auckland, which is a melting pot of so many cultures. Uh, uh, I look back now and I was just so fortunate uh, to be able to, to, to go through that. Um, and yeah, I was lucky enough to get a phone call back in 1992 to move to our parent company in Germany and, and the rest is history. Wow, um, that that is amazing. And I remember um, just like reading about you uh, and just finding it fascinating how you've kind of made these kind of transitions and just this really amazing rocket like speed up in this corporate world. So I kind of wanted to delve a little bit deeper into that. Um, can you tell us like, when you were an international track athlete, um, in that period of time, how what was that like? And how did that prepare you for your future career in life? Uh, I think that might be a little bit embellished. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was lucky enough to, to represent our country uh, a few times. Um, but I think the most important lesson there is, you know, the people that you surround yourself with. Um, and in track and field, you're only as good as what you put in. Uh, so I think one of the most important lessons I took from track is you don't put in the hard work. You're not, you're not going to get the rewards. You know, there's nowhere to hide uh, when, you're, when you're out there racing in front of everyone. Um, so the first piece, I think, is making sure that you're surrounded with the right people. Uh, second piece is just so fortunate to, to have uh, coaches and mentors along the way uh, that could really steer you in the right direction. You know, as, a, as a teenager, let's just say um, 
Uh, I wasn't the greatest student. Uh, I, I left high school with no qualifications, um, started packing shoes as a 16 year old in a, you know, in a warehouse in, in Auckland. Um, uh, but I was lucky enough to meet the, the chief of police of West Auckland, uh, let's just say through creative ways. Uh, but he used to be the, um, the, one of the national track and field coaches. And he, yeah, he took me off the streets and a year later I was, I was breaking junior records over, over hurdles. So um, I think, yeah, uh, just sending the message back to everyone listening back at home, uh, we should never underestimate the, you know, the talent that we have with the youth uh, in New Zealand. Sometimes they just need to be pointed in the right way. Uh, and given that support network uh, to give them the chance. Yeah, the, the story that um, you just shared about meeting the, the police officer, um, can you tell us a little bit more about that kind of mentorship? What did that mean to you? And, and uh, I, I know that you're doing a lot for others as well in that role. So what did that teach you in that experience and how you're using that now? Uh, we would need an hour to talk about it. First off, I just want to say how we met was a case of mistaken identity. Um, but uh, you know what, what my coach put into me, uh, I will never, ever forget. You know, being there through whether it was good weather, bad weather. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I lost him last year. Uh, he passed away. Uh, but I do remember a training in the, um, in the forests of, of uh, West Auckland. Uh, and I saw him one day uh, in the trees watching me. Uh, and it was pouring down with rain. It was a very tough session. Uh, but he didn't let me know that he was there and I didn't let him know that I saw him spying on me. And I thought about it uh, a long time. Uh, and then I really realized he was checking on whether I was doing what I say I was going to do. Uh, and I think it was a very important lesson uh, that I put in the yards when he wasn't around. And that's what you want your team to do, right? Is when you give uh, a, a vision and instruction, you want to empower them to go and get the job done. Uh, but you don't want to be micromanaging and watching every step, excuse the pun, every step of the way. Uh, so I think the first piece is just making sure that you, you know, there's no shortcuts. Um, you said I've had a fast career. Uh, it doesn't feel like fast. You know, it's 24 years. Um, and and the, the second key message I'd say is we, we set really ambitious goals uh, that we wanted to be you know, the first person to break 50 seconds for 400 meter hurdles. But every year we just had very small incremental steps to get us there. Otherwise, as a, as a youngster, it, it would have felt like a goal that was too far. Uh, but each year we managed to tick off those goals and all of a sudden uh, we reached those. Uh, the third piece I would say is, yeah, the sky uh, is certainly not the limit. It's just the view. And I think sometimes when you put a limit on yourself and you reach that, you can store. Uh, so another lesson that I'd look back and uh, from, from that mentor is never setting a limit. You know, always say, okay, here's the goal. When you achieve that, okay, what's next? Yeah. You know? Otherwise, as soon as you're complacent, uh, the competitors are going to come around and they're going to beat you really fast. Wow, that's that's uh, such a powerful story. I love hearing that. Uh, and yeah, I, li I like the idea of like the sky is the view, not the limit. Um, with that, maybe you can uh, share a little bit more about some uh, different opportunities or difficulties you've had along this journey. Uh, what have been some of the adversities you've had to overcome? <laughs> where, where, where do you want to start? Um, uh, I'd say last year is um, without a doubt the most um, both personal and professionally challenging year of my life. Um, here in the US and Dale and I can certainly you know, testify this year, we had social unrest, uh, so we had the, the, uh, the change of the administration hopefully happening, uh, you had Black Lives Matters, here on the, on the West Coast we had wildfires, we closed our office in March, uh, uh, March the 14th uh, and it's still closed. Yeah, so we've been working uh, locked up at home uh, for over 14 months now uh, and our schools have been closed. So people are working full time, no such time as a nine to five anymore. You're, you're a mum, you're a dad, you're a school teacher. Uh, so the mental pressure has just been absolutely uh, immense. Um, so I think through that, um, there, there were certainly moments that all of us, including myself, felt like you know, it wasn't worth it. Um, but I kept saying to myself, uh, when I left New Zealand for the first time to go to the World Juniors, uh, my coach gave me a letter, and in that letter it said, winners never quit, uh, and quitters never win. Uh, and I'll be very vulnerable right now. There were times I wanted to quit last year. Uh, it just felt so much. Um, but uh, I kept thinking back to that. It's like day by day. Let's just get through every single day. Uh, and we've managed to turn the corner and come out of it as a much stronger brand, uh, and we've started this year incredibly well. So, uh, yeah, uh, 
you're always going to have adversity. It's how you it's how you continue to get back up and, and tackle it. Yeah, actually, um, can you tell us more about the campaigns that you ended up running for the different initiatives? I know we talked a little bit about um, diversity and inclusion, but you also had several others. Sustainability, the, I just saw the campaign that you guys launched uh, with mycelium, right? With bolt threads. I just think that's phenomenal. Maybe share with the audience all of those different factors and what that was. Yeah, in, in, in no particular order, and uh, I'm not sure if you can see uh, behind me, but I'm in that campus right now, and and that uh, that uh, soccer field is actually made uh, out of recycled ocean plastic. Yeah, so we've made a commitment to, a few years ago that we wanted to be the brand that helps end plastic waste. Uh, if you're not aware, there's you know there's more plastic uh, in the ocean than there are stars in the skies, uh, and if we don't rally together now, um, the oceans will die very quickly. Um, if you want to have a, a very disturbing uh, documentary, I'd encourage you to watch Sea Spiracy on Netflix, uh, and it will certainly make you change the way uh, that you think about uh, everything that you do in your day-to-day -day life. So we started a couple of years ago, and we figured out how to make a shoe out of recycled ocean plastic. And at that stage, we went to the United Nations, and it was one shoe. Uh, fast forward to, to last year, and I think we made 19 million pairs of shoes out of recycled plastic. Yeah, uh, but it's just the start. We need our competitors to join us, and they are. Uh, just recently, uh, we've made an announcement that by 2025, nine out of 10 articles, uh, so 90% of everything we make will be sustainable, uh, which is a fantastic uh, uh, goal. Uh, and at the same time, we've just started making shoes out of uh, mushrooms. Yeah, uh, so I remember signing a, a confidential contract a few years ago. The team came around to me and they showed me this material and they're like, Zeon, this is really cool. You need to sign this and ourselves and Chanel and a couple other brands, we're going to lead this. And I was like, what are you talking about? And uh, long story short, we've, we've just made shoes out of mushrooms. So uh, it's just amazing what you can do when you really, you know, again, sky is not the limit. Um, so really pleased with the progress that we're making in sustainability, but we can't do this alone. You know, we need every industry and every government uh, around the world to really lean into this. Uh, the second one around diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion, you know, obviously with Black Lives Matters here, um, uh, it was a moment for us uh, that we either really uh, looked internally uh, and say, what can we do more? You know, the, uh, the richness of our brand, our founder, Adi Dazla, met Jesse Owens under the stadium in the 1936 Berlin Olympics to give him his spikes. Uh, so uh, we, we want to continue uh, to make sure that we, we do what's right. Uh, and, you know, um, there has been uh, systemic uh, situations, uh, not only here in the US, but around the world that has to be addressed. So last year, we, we made a stand. Uh, we made a commitment with our, our black leaders here. They, they came to me and it was called the trusted few. Uh, and we, we went to our executive board and we presented a plan of what we want to do to make sure both internally, externally with our communities, uh, on how we can really give back to both the Black and the Latinx community. Uh, it's 12 months later, and we're coming up to the, uh, obviously, uh, George Floyd's tragic killing anniversary. We've made tremendous progress. Uh, we're putting 120 million US dollars into it, but it's not about writing a check. It's about really making sure that we're truly giving back and giving these kids a chance uh, for sport to change their lives, and be it sport or art or music. Uh, so we've come a really long way, uh, but we've still got a long, long way to go. It's just the start. So around D, E, and I uh, and sustainability, uh, we're really pleased with the progress, but we're not uh, pleased with our position. I, I just personally admire a brand like yours and what you've built in, in really inculcating some of the cultural uh, dimensions and changes into the brand itself and not just um, and leading in many ways. And thank you for doing that. I'm curious, I, there has been a resurgence, you even pointed to it, of the Adidas brand. Uh, I'm sure these campaigns uh, helped, but are there other things uh, that you can share about like the strategy behind the brand and what enabled it to grow at the pace that it has? Are you referencing the US in particular? Yes. Well, this wasn't gray in 2014. I'll, I'll start with that. Um, yeah, uh, my boss sold me, uh, sold me uh, uh, let's just say some fake news uh, and said, yeah, we're doing okay in the US. And I got here and we were getting thumped. Yeah, we, we were the number five brand. Uh, we were known, you know, factually, we were actually reported in, um, in the press as the German soccer brand. Uh, so first and foremost, 
uh, we needed to give, um, uh, make sure that we became relevant in both US sport and US culture. Uh, so after you know, 90 days of doing a very quick um, deep dive into the market, myself and the president at the time, we flew up to Germany and we presented a turnaround plan. Luckily, uh, they gave us the support um, uh, and we, we, we really started investing into key heartbeat sports and icons here that would give us credibility in our space. So we started signing NFL players, Major League Baseball players. We signed National Hockey League. We re-signed Major League Soccer, you know, women's NBA players, women's soccer players, just to get our brand back on the field of play. So, you know, the US kid could see. So that was one piece that we had to build sport credibility. But at the same time, athletes uh, and, and the youth of today, they take their inspiration not just from uh, the superstars on the court or the ice or wherever it may be, they also look to music, art and culture. Uh, so then we started partnering with the likes of Pharrell, you know, and, and we, we, we created something called open source. You know, we, we used to always design in here and not show everyone and keep it secret. And then we're like, how do we just blow this up and start working with some outside partners to bring in new inspiration and ideas and, and really challenge our status quo? Um, and you know, it, was, it was not easy. It took us two years to really turn it around, but then we started getting some sell through success. So I think the first piece is in no particular orders. It was making sure that a parent company started getting serious about what it takes to win here in North America. Most importantly, I'd say is culture. Uh, and we had to make sure that our great teammates had a reason to stay and to believe that we could compete. Uh, and so at that stage, you've got a Kiwi coming from South Korea on stage, just landed in America, doesn't know anything about football, baseball. You know, when I say football, I'm talking about American football. And I'm saying, hey, believe we're going to win. You know, the, the audience is sitting there like, yeah, right. You're the, you're the fifth guy to come through. Um, so you, you have to actually be really real about it. Say, we know we've got a hard turnaround. Um, but we've put so much effort into genuine care. Two key words is genuine care. Uh, and making sure that we'd sit down and understand the pain points and what's not working, why isn't it working? How do we uh, you know, barge that out of the way and, and make sure that we could unleash human capital? Uh, because there's so many great talented people, but they weren't being uh, given the empowerment to, to get their job done in the most creative way. So I'd say that would be the, the second piece. Um, the first, third piece is relentless, is you know, as I talked about you know, in track, it's you know, the day you relax, you're going to get thumped. You know, so it was a relentless focus about uh, winning. Yeah, you know, we're not here to compete. We're, we're here to win, and winning comes in different shapes and sizes. Uh, but then, you know, fast forward to 2016, we had a good year. In 2017, we grew over 1.2 billion dollars here in the US alone, um, and that really put us back on the map. You know, and all of a sudden, uh, we stopped Nike growing for a year. We became a strong number two. But you know, you, you must remain humble because as we've done that, of course, our competitors is going to come back and thump us as hard as they, as they can as well. So you know, I'd say around talent, you know, it's belief, it's culture, it's investment, and it's about you know, making sure that you never, ever relax. So no complacency. Thank you so much. I just personally felt like when I was listening to your story, just how driven you are, but you also have these like very, very strong values about, like you said, genuine care, and it really comes across uh, Thank you so much, Yon. I look forward to having more Q&A with you. Um, so with that, I would love to introduce our next speaker. Uh, she is a phenomenal lady, and I am just uh, so excited to, to bring her up on stage. Uh, Dale Nirvani Pfeiffer is the founder and CEO of Good World. Thousands of organizations use Good World software to fundraise, connect communities, and power social impact movements. Goodworld was named one of the world's most innovative companies and a world-changing idea by Fast Company magazine. Dale was named New Zealand Woman of the Year in the community category by the Next magazine. So with that, thank you so much, uh, Dale, for taking time to chat with us today. Again, I'd love to start with a similar question to you. Uh, can you share with us um, your background, what got you on this journey? Just uh, let the audience know a little bit about you and then we'll ask more questions. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Div. You've uh, made me blush. So, um, and Z, it was just fantastic to hear all the work that you're doing at Adidas. And, you know, congratulations on both the turnaround of the company, but more importantly, how you've really got the company focused on truly making a difference to heal the world um, right now at this tricky time. So thank you so much for that. 
Um, so, you know, I'm a, first of all, I'm from Invercargill, um, which is actually where I am right now. Um, I came down here for a few months during the pandemic. So um, I hope there's more people out in the audience from Invercargill. I see John McIntyre, you're, you're on the phone. So it's a fantastic um, place to be from because I feel like if you're from Invercargill, pretty much like most of New Zealand, you know, you grow up with your feet on the ground. Um, however, you know, I did also grow up with my head in the stars, you know, Invercargill is probably one of the best places in the whole world to, for the night sky, the aurora australis, the southern lights, you know, sometimes you wake up in the morning and you're part of this glowing, psychedelic kind of, you know, uh, environment where, you know, the night sky fully opens up into these crazy colours. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm from Invercargill and um, that is a really so important part of who I am um, and I, um, I sort of my first career was as an academic I um, came up and ran the Center for the Study of Leadership at Victoria University which is a small research center and we we're fortunate enough to do a lot of research with um, Maori leaders um, uh, probably most significant to me was um, I was sort of the um, person who wrote a lot of research reports on something called the Hui Tomata, which was a group of uh, Maori leaders which came together with the New Zealand government to kind of think about what's next for, you know, Maori um, uh, economic development in the country. And, you know, as we all know, Maori are an incredible force when it comes to economic um, development and prowess. Um, and so I was really fortunate to work with um, Sir Paul Reeves very closely, Nata to Love, Sir Hilary Mokomid, um, you know, some of the, the real greats and um, that really um, experience really cemented sort of my, uh, a lot of my views on, on leadership. And then um, I actually ended up at the Kennedy School researching leadership and love and how the principles of love can really help strengthen leadership, particularly in societies and bring together big diverse groups. Um, so, and that really, you know, I was traveling so much from the Center for the Study of Leadership at Vic in Wellington to overseas. You know, I remember one year I traveled to the US seven times and I was like, this is ridiculous. You know, obviously the US is calling, so I ended up um, uh, moving actually to New York City and uh, working for a place called the East West Institute, which was a backdoor diplomacy organization, a, a big channel between US, Russia, US, China. Um, you know, it's kind of like one of those pinch, many pinch yourself moments when you're kind of, you know, furiously taking notes, um, you know, meetings between the Chinese Communist Party and the Democrats and the Republicans and everything. And, you know, of course, I was, you know, pretty much there to, to serve um, those people. But that ultimately, um, being in the States, I think, you know, one thing um, Xavier asked me to, to, to mention is, um, you know, that ultimately led me to, to founding my, my company, Good World. Um, which I'm really excited to, to share a little more about. But, um, you know, one thing that um, Xavier sort of asked me to mention is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from a, a, a family down here who is very much committed to service. Um, you know, we grew up in our household thinking about, okay, well, what is the most, what, what is the way that we can have the biggest positive impact on other people's lives? That was sort of like our, our North Star. So, you know, that's what I've sort of tried to do. And that's sort of the, the, the litmus test I use to just sort of decide what I'm, what I'm going to do. So, you know, first of all, in academia and um, playing a, a, a kind of a, a role um, assisting, you know, the development of Maori leadership and leadership in New Zealand. Um, then on to kind of, you know, diplomacy and now um, with through my company, Good World. Thank you so much, Dale. I, I, your story is just so fascinating. Like the idea of like putting leadership and love together seems so foreign, but also so, so relevant. Um, so I just love that you started with that. And, you know, like your, your family background of impact driven and, you know, where you've 
come like full circle now with your company. So I'd love to talk to you about how the idea of Goodwill started. Um, tell us more about that. Yeah, so I, I kind of reached a moment where, you know, I was really actively seeking in this question, like, how can I, how can my life matter? How can I really um, have, make the biggest impact, positive impact for other people? And, you know, I just, I just reached this moment and it was, a, it was a really interesting thing. I've done academia, I've done sort of the nonprofit um, world and found them really, really rewarding, but was really looking for like what I was meant to do. Um, and, you know, they're fantastic ways to make a huge difference. Um, and so I just, all of a sudden, I was very interested about the private sector and how the private sector really act as a, as a force for good. And so I just decided one day, and it was like this very kind of deep thing that almost came out of me, like, I'm going to create a company called Good World. And it is going to do the most amount of good. And, you know, as I was sort of in my early 30s, hadn't worried about my financial health, you know, um, on my own, I was like, okay, this company actually has to make money as well. So that was sort of what I, um, you know, where, where I started. And we first went to market um, with this idea that I had around social media. You know, I moved to the States in 2008. And at the time, that was when kind of social media networks were really, really growing. Um, and I was probably spending far too much time on social media because I was, you know, connect back, like wanting to connect with my family and my friends and all that sort of stuff. So I had this um, idea and, you know, part of what we've been studying at the Kennedy School is networks. So I was like, I had this idea that, um, you know, social networks, we could sort of co-opt them as a, as a place where, you know, this, um, uh, we could use the, the principles that I've learned through the research that I've done on love. How could we really foster this community of, of love and caring on social media? So um, the first thing that we did, and particularly through, money like you know I think that money is a, is a very heavy dense medium that we all have in our lives and it's a great divider and it's a great thing to bring people together so I was like the first thing that we we actually did is um, Good World was a fintech company so we created a way to instantly pay other people on social media and went to market through donations so, you know, essentially what we did is we created technology where on any social media post, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you could just write hashtag donate on a dollar amount. And, um, you know, the first time you'd be prompted to sign up with your credit card, but then after that, you could simply write hashtag donate on a dollar amount. And, um, and people would, the, co the company that you were writing the post on would receive the donation. So for example, you could write hashtag donate $100 on the Nature Conservancies or Greenpeace or Save the Children or UNICEF's post and you can still go and do this today. Um, and uh, they will receive $100. So, you know, that um, scaled really fast once we finally got it to market and boy I could tell you some stories about uh, getting that to market um, once we finally got it to market it hit right that sweet spot the ice bucket challenge had just happened in fact they were our first customer and um, and everybody's kind of uh, uh, nonprofit CEO board member was tapping them on the shoulder and goes, where's our multi-million dollar Facebook fundraising campaign? And so, you know, we scaled really rapidly. Um, we kind of got to about 4,000 nonprofits really quickly. Um, and, um, you know, the company was, was going really well. And it was just really, I mean, just, you know, from, building this company for three or four years and then getting to that point is just like a walk on water kind of a moment. Um, but then, um, you know, it is the real entrepreneurial journey. Um, you know, we, after a year of kind of growing, it's very, very difficult to build on other people's platforms, particularly companies like Facebook and Twitter, because you don't have any power over the product that you're building on. So, you know, we would wake up in the morning, Facebook had changed an algorithm or there was a bug in Facebook, our technology wouldn't work, Twitter, like, and we just couldn't create the user experience that we wanted. And of course, uh, a year after we have been growing so rapidly, Facebook actually introduced, which was our main platform, Twitter was our second platform, um, introduced their own donations technology. So, um, 
you know, it was a, a, a real, um, it was a, it was a, it was a bit of a crazy moment, and then they ended up coming and taking most of our market share in, in the social media donation space. So, um, and uh, Twitter and obviously Instagram also has its. We created Swipe Up to donate. Uh, Instagram has its own um, uh, donations technology, um, and Twitter hasn't really moved in that space yet. But you know, we were left from a rapidly growing kind of profitable business right off the other side almost, you know, with a technology stack after we'd spent so much time building this technology stack, um, you know, that wasn't really being used because everybody had kind of transitioned onto to Facebook's technology. It's so much well better funded than ours. And um, and uh, it ended up, you know, that, that, that um, technology with Facebook is one of the most successful technology kind of products that Facebook has really ever launched. So, you know, we're kind of, it was this crazy moment for me as a founder. And I can tell you there was a, a number of times when we um, nearly shut down the company and I can, you know, tell you all sorts of uh, stories, preferably over a beer because, uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, you know, I always went back to kind of my, my litmus test of, you know, what is it through the company that I can do that I think is really going to change things and help people? So um, we were fortunate. Um, so what I started to see, and it's, it's so great, Z, that you talked all about what you're doing at Adidas because it's something that I just relate to so strongly. You know, when I started Good World, it was really all, you know, um, you know when I started it, you know, I just started to see all of a sudden this huge, um, initiative from uh, private corporations to really like scale up social good. And some people like, some corporations were beginning to do it. Others were kind of a little bit late off the track, but sort of saw others doing it and knew that they, they had to do it. I mean, the need for social impact and, um, and corporate social responsibility, responsibility solutions um, was absolutely skyrocketing. And I was like, wow, this is so awesome. Because working with uh, nonprofits for so long, um, what I knew was that, you know, nonprofits are notoriously underfunded and they're not able to invest in the things that would probably really help the industry as a whole, like, you know, marketing, fundraising, all of that sort of stuff, because there is a drive for optimization, optimization around dollars, uh, uh, philanthropic dollars for programs. So everybody wants to know that if they donate a dollar, they're going to plant a tree, they're not going to support some fundraising effort. So, um, you know, what I really knew was that businesses could really help nonprofits optimize with the way that businesses are structured, you know, they're structured for, you know, um, success and, um, you know, really like driving towards different outcomes and, you know, um, have really great operating systems and things like that. So, um, we we're fortunate enough to be able to acquire a company about 18 months ago, a full technology suite, and now we've kind of really launched out into the corporate social responsibility space. Um, we've developed an algorithm for um, social impact called GeForce, which is the most exponential way that companies can um, make a difference. Essentially, if a company um, gives a dollar through GeForce, what we do is we split it up into um, little amounts and um, give it out to customers and employees, and then they are able to allocate it back um, to the to the areas of interest or the nonprofits that those people are the most passionate about and become advocates for those causes. And so now we're doing this with our MasterCard, Citibank. Um, planted, um, we just about, we just uh, launched a campaign with um, the um, Master League Baseball, the NBA, um, a tree planting campaign on TikTok. Um, so we're, we're really uh, proud of, um, really proud of this uh, new technology suite and, and where we're focused and where we're going as a company. Wow, thank you for that story, Dale. I, your stories of just going up and down and almost losing the company, but like really, like you said, asking those litmus test questions and seeing the new trends and where you could continue to be a force of good uh, through the private sector. It's like uh, phenomenal, um, you know, 
a turnaround. It's interesting that you and Zion both had that those moments in your respective companies. So with that, we're going to start the Q&A. I think that will be a great way to uh, begin um, asking that question, Ron. What was that moment like when you were having to make that turnaround? I'm sh like, how did it feel in that moment? And what were the steps you guys had to take to actually build that turnaround? Um, so welcome both you and Zion on the floor, and uh, I'll let either one of you start. And also the, uh, for the audience that is joining us today, please uh, feel free to type in your question in the q and I'm just going to kick these questions off uh, just to get us started, but we will definitely be asking your questions very shortly. I can I can start and then hand it over to you, Z, because I guess I'm off mute. <laughs> um, you know, these are the these are the hard hard moments, and there's so many hard things about hard things. You know, like sometimes team members have to change. Sometimes, and it's you know, I feel like the entrepreneurial journey is just is never really over, and I feel like that's what it is. Is also like when you're operating out of your home environment. I mean, even now I'm not sleeping because. We only have, you know, because making this pivot, we only have four and a half months of ramp left in the company right now. And, um, you know, nobody wants to, and, you know, it's very hard as a female founder to get investment. You know, only 2% of venture capital goes to female founders. And I think as a social impact company, um, it's, it's even tougher. Um, but, you know, so I think though these are the heart, the, the, the heart-wrenching moments, but I think one thing that we have as New Zealanders is resilience. You know, I feel like one of the, one of the things that we learn as kids often, you know, I feel like in other cultures, you know, you often feel like somebody is going to balloon in and save you. As Kiwis, I think we are more independent and learn that we really need to um, create solutions for ourselves and focus on practically getting things done and, um, and, and trying new ways of doing things. It's kind of like the, the number eight, um, the number eight fencing wire kind of solution. And I think that is a really fantastic thing about being a Kiwi, learning, learning that as a, as, at a young age. And uh, Z, I will hand it over to you to, yeah. Thanks, Dale. First off, hats off to you. I mean, what, you, what you've done um, through your own uh, platform, uh, you don't have the backing of a major corporate that I do. So your achievement versus mine is a completely different field and the courage that you've demonstrated is just amazing. So uh, I loved uh, what you said about leadership and love. Um, behind my desk in the office, I've got Hetangata, Hetangata, Hetangata on a huge uh, mural behind me. The day that comes down is the day I don't work here. Yeah, and I think uh, to answer your question is if, if you have that litmus, if you know why you're coming to work every single day, and for me, it's the people, the people, the people. Uh, and if I can give back just like others gave to me throughout my journey, um, and I can change someone's life, those are the days that I go home and say that was an awesome day. You know, the days that you get a card underneath the, uh, uh, or a letter or an email versus, hey, we just grew you know, a billion dollars. That, that was that was fine but it's not one of the memories that I, yeah, that I remember the memories that I remember are, are when you get a, a letter from the union leader of South Korea's wife has said you have no idea what what the love that you've given back to our people and how it's changed the culture so I think those turnaround moments you just got to keep grounded into what you feel is is right in your heart uh, and as long as you've got the support of the company that allows you to be that individual and authentic person then 99% of the time it works out, yeah? Uh, but it's, it's, it's not easy. I always tell people that they want to come up with a ladder, I'm like, be careful what you wish for, you know? Um, because it does become that, you know, pressure's a privilege. And if you can't handle that pressure uh, or find an avenue to make sure that you remember, in my world, it's shoes and T-shirts. But really what we hear is, is to help kids play sport. When that happens, you're changing their lives. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, awesome um, ways to kind of connect the two stories as well um, with your turnaround stories. So I, I do want to bring up the audience questions. So the first one is by, if I'm, um, by the way, if I ever say your name wrong, feel free to um, just pipe up. Um, this is from Camilo. In the current state of world affairs, what would be your message for the upcoming generations with respect to hope and future? Zion, do you want to take that first? Yeah, without a doubt. Um... Uh, you know, dream big, but but aim small. And what I mean by that, it just goes back to what I learned through track is 
you know, the dream is here, but you've got to set those small steps to make sure that they're achievable and you see that progress. You know, uh, and I think it's so important because kids today think, okay, I'm going to be there tomorrow um, because they don't realize what it takes. So I think just making sure that they've got those steps. So it's a staircase you know, to heaven, uh, for lack of a bit of analogy, uh, is, is so important. So that's that's first piece is, you know, never stop your kids from dreaming. Uh, I think it's so important. Um, I always had a dream and I actually woke up this morning and I thought about it. And, uh, this is, I'm not sure if you all remember this, but this jersey came to, um, I think it was 1992. And I just left high school, um, zero money, you know, and a, a jersey like that was the pinnacle of the Adidas brand. And for me, that's was, you know, to be an athlete and we have that jersey was like the Daily Thompsons of the world. Um, and I, I saved up all my paper round money and all the rest and managed to buy it. And I keep it because it just reminds me of where I was, where I was at, you know, zero money, living in the caravan, uh, all the rest. And, and that jersey just keeps me grounded. And, and so I think the, key, the, the next message is there's no shortcut, but keep humble and never ever forget your roots. Um, because sometimes you can have an amazing career, uh, but you can't forget where you come from. Yeah. Um yeah that's yeah that really resonates with Maisie and the other piece I would add to that is you know don't forget who you are and in fact make that a lifelong quest to really remember who you are I think you know we're all born these incredibly perfect um, things people with our own blueprint and I think authentically getting back to who we are you know innately is so important you know really discovering what it is that makes you tick I'm um, really going back to those values and I think you know Z mentioned that but the Kiwi values are really great values it's really um, been so one of the most refreshing parts about being home for a few months is really rediscovering New Zealand values and how special they are and how strongly people in this country advocate for those values they're like almost like the DNA of New Zealand. So, you know, really remembering who you are and really bringing that to your work. New Zealand leaders are very values driven. And I think that's probably something, you know, for both Z and I, that's actually really helped us in our careers and helped us pr propel us forward. So um, that, that's probably all, all I would add. Thank you, both of you. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, in some ways, you know, understanding the culture and where you brought were brought up those values, but also I'm hearing you say like really self reflect and see what of those values are really resonating with you the most, and like take making sure those are the ones that shine. Um, so with that, Lupe says thank you, Zion and Dale. Awesome, Corero. How much of your success can you put down to taking risks? What's your advice around calculating risk and backing your decisions? Do you want to take that, Dale, first? Sure. I um, I think I, I'm a very pro-risk oriented person. Um, and I think I live, live my life a little bit more. For me, it feels more risky not to take the risk um, because I feel like sometimes if I play it safe, um, I won't be fulfilling, you know, what my what my path here on earth could or should be. So um, uh, I guess it kind of define, it depends how you define risk and what risk really means to you. Um, but I would say that um, taking that risk to really discover, you know, both who I am and what my path should be here on earth has been a fundamental part of, of, um, of my journey and my success. Yeah, I, I would add, um, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail, right? Um, so I think first and foremost, you, you just can't be, you know, go out and just take crazy risks without having a plan behind it. Um, but I, I could, could not agree more with Dale was uh, if, you, if you're waiting to say, okay, now I'm ready, it's too late. You're never ready for that next step. You know? um, and I think those are the moments when you do get these opportunities. And I've had multiple opportunities in my career. So, okay, Z, we're going to move you to here. Uh, and, you know, deep down, like, oh, shit, am I ready for this? You know, um, and if you don't back yourself, uh, but again, stay humble, then you know, my path could have been very, very different. Uh, so I think you've, you've just got to remember uh, everyone 
has these opportunities. Everyone has to, yeah, at some stage, be thrown in the deep end, uh, but realize what you're getting yourself into and then throw yourself into the areas that you're not so familiar with. Yeah, so I think it's super important that you're also uh, reflective of where your strengths and also your weaknesses are. And it doesn't mean you have to be strong at everything, but make sure you surround yourself with people that are strong at that so you know, the company or your business doesn't get in trouble. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I want to do rapid fire questions now because we're nearly at time and I want to make sure we get most of the audience's questions in. So um, William Perry, who's actually, uh, we all met together, Xavier, Will and I in the same New Zealand Medical Student Association. So, so hi, Will. What are the notable differences between New Zealand and US cultures that affect your company and how do you manage these with your team? So Zion, do you want to kick us off? Well, do you want to define US culture? <laughs> <laughs> that's I um yeah you know, I had no idea you know when I went to New York the first time you know New York's not one culture you know if, if you're in Harlem versus Manhattan versus up there it's, it's it's been such a huge learning curve you know from the Midwest to the, the Pacific Northwest to California it's 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 huge yeah so America is not made up of one culture so quite a challenging question um uh what what I would say is is the Kiwis. Uh, we, we should never underestimate how good we are at innovation. You know, it's so strong and it's in our DNA, but we just don't do this about it, which is great. Um, yeah, I'm really proud. I had the, the luxury, the opportunity, sorry, um, uh, unfortunate uh, situation to meet Tim Brown, there, one of the founders of Allbirds. Um, we had a great conversation and I was like, why don't, you know, why don't we do something together? And long story short, we're about to launch uh, Adidas and Allbirds first ever uh, collaboration, which is the first time this company has ever partnered with an outside brand uh, in this space. And we're going to make the world's uh, shoe with the least carbon footprint. Uh, so again, it's just, uh, I think uh, the Kiwi culture in terms of being humble, but also you know, innovation is outstanding. Uh, I know I didn't answer the question, but it's, uh, I think our innovation culture and, and humility is, is something we can be so proud of. Yeah. And I think I would say um, one of the big things that kind of really got me stuck when I first arrived in the US was, um, was a, I'm a leadership geek, so forgive me for a second, but there's a very, very simple leadership model, one of the first ones, and there's two dimensions to it, one's task and one's group. So, you know, the US is like very, very high on task and very, very low on group. And the in New Zealand is very, very high on group and very low, low on task. So what that means if you go to the US, you are really going to be judged on how well you do according to your task, your goals, the business goals, that sort of thing. But group as in like bringing, you know, people along with you and everything, that's not as important, whereas it's the absolute re reverse in New Zealand. So that was something that got me a little bit stuck at the beginning. Um, and it took me a while to kind of adjust and understand why I wasn't perhaps being as successful by doing the same things in the US as what I'd done in New Zealand. That is so fascinating uh, and uh, something I have felt myself. So thanks for like, expressing that so much more vividly than I would have ever been able to express that. Um, and so the next question is by Chris. Uh, what has most surprised you during COVID-19 uh, COVID about yourself and about others? So Dale? Sorry, sorry. You're yeah. sweet, um, <laughs> I know this is something that's come up again and again, but I think it, it, it really is getting back to that point of resilience and, you know, rapid, being able to respond rapidly to changing environment. I mean, the, the environment that we um, live in on our day-to-day -day changes so fast with, anyway, but over COVID, during COVID-19, you know, as Z mentioned, like they all went home and they're still not back at the office. It changes overnight. And I think, you know, one of the things that it really taught me is, is not to really have too many, many assumptions about how things are going to be, you know, next week, next month, you know, whatever, and really plan for that, um, really plan for a level of not knowing. Um, I think that's, that's one of the kind of the things I learned, how to adapt rapidly and, and plan for that level of uncertainty. Yeah, I've... This was a tough, it was a great question first and foremost. Um, I think if I reflect on it, I, I look back now in terms pre-COVID that today I make decisions a lot faster. Um, 
because I think it's so important uh, to, to cut through the BS and, and make sure that we're making the right decisions to protect our people um, uh, and ultimately come out of the out of through COVID in a strong company situation. I mean, we very quickly were in a cash crisis. We run the company by a P&L versus the balance sheet. Um, so it was a major, major learning curve. Um, so I look at myself, what I learned about myself is um, uh, just making sure I get the facts and make quick decisions because people needed that support because they were so concerned about everything else that was going on. Um, what did I learn about others is um, those are the moments that you have to stand up. You know, so every quarter I was like, what can I do to inspire my team of 12 and a half thousand people to make sure that mentally, you know, emotionally, uh, that we're really taking care of? Because when you can't see them, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, so I remember in the first quarter that we shut down, uh, I started walking a marathon every week in my lunchtime. Uh, and I inspired, I said, everyone else, let's get out there and you know, do it safely. Uh, and all of a sudden, we had a competition around the world. Uh, I had some friends that despised me because in Dubai, you weren't allowed to leave your house. So they had to walk around the house doing marathons. But long story short, we had hundreds of people uh, around the world staying active because if you weren't active, it was too easy to get into bad habits, you know, sitting on the couch, drinking too much, whatever it may be. And so each quarter I was like, now what can I do to inspire others? Uh, and importantly, make sure that you just do the simple things and pick up the phone and check on people. You know, if you've been home alone for 14 months, if you're a single person in downtown Portland, when you've got all the riots and everything going on, it's a frightening situation. Uh, so that the simple things and just putting that genuine care back in really helped uh, a lot. Thank you again, both of you, and um, and I, I I love um, what you both said. And something I wanted to um, bring up with you, Zion, when you originally in your first qu the question just before, I love that you're like partnering with another Kiwi company. I just think Kiwis helping other Kiwis is the reason why Kiwi Leaders Network exists, and what you're exemplifying there is exactly what we want to create here. And I I'm, I'm sure the team is like I just wants to applaud you for that. Um, so with that, uh, the last question, because uh, we do want to wrap up somewhat on time, uh, is from Sophie. Um, how can we, New Zealand uh, Maori, who live, work in America, do more to advance Maori economic development? I got to sneak home for three months due to COVID um, and Zoom for my job in the USA. But now that I'm back in the US, all my heart wants to do is more for Maori. What can I do? Um, that is a Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I really um, wish I had a, um, a, a clear, a better answer. You know, I think the answer to that really lies in, inside of your community. And, um, uh, you know, it's uh, great to have that moment to be able to be back and to really absorb um, that energy and uh, all the conversations and that I'm sure that you had and I think you know one thing that I've learned obviously is about you know it's, it's all about the conversations and it's about understanding what is truly truly required and, and taking things um, one step at a time so you know I think even asking those that question of you know of, of, of your community would be a really powerful thing to to start doing because, you know, I just, you know, I think one thing about a Maori perspective is that it is so much broader and comprehensive. And, you know, one thing I really learned about Maori business when I was working with the Hui Tomata was, um, you know, I think they've, you know, Maori very much see business as a global thing, whereas often what from my research, what I saw was Pākehā New Zealanders were thinking about business more as a bound in, inside of New Zealand. So I'm sure there is, is so much you can do, but I would just encourage you to ask those questions. Yeah, again, I, I was struggling with, a, you know, coming up with a, uh, an answer just for the sake of coming up with an answer. But as I reflect on this, you know, what is the opportunity that you can bring to your community? Uh, and if you can find that opportunity uh, and then think about the multi-culture and then say, how can the two potentially you know, come together 
uh, I'm just thinking what are the right questions you should be asking yourself that will ultimately give you the answer I think to your question. Thank you uh, once again everyone for joining us today it was uh, one of the most uh, delightful events to be part of it just for those of us that haven't had the opportunity to go home during COVID uh, it also um, is making at least me yearn to get back there I'm just like I just want to get back there as soon as possible but thank you for doing that um, I want to really thank Xavier Walker for like um, you know, kickstarting this event for us and the entire team uh, with Sky and Jennifer who helped with a lot of the marketing and, and the, you know, the slew of sponsors that we had, like amazing Kiwi support. That's exactly the kind of um, things that we want to encourage here. Uh, I saw Leslie sent that message. If anyone wants to continue to collaborate, please, please, please type your name or just say hello in the chat so people can recognize you and maybe reach out. Um, also wanna say again, thank you, Jeremy, for coming along and really like being part of this event. Uh, we love the fact that New Zealand uh, government is so involved with our leaders here and our companies here. So thank you for your support. And uh, once again, Zion, Dale, uh, for being the phenomenal leaders you are and bringing group with you, bringing uh, the tangata with you, bringing people with you. We can really feel it, the way you're speaking and leading your companies. And uh, I really want to see more leaders like you develop and uh, bring those values with them to the US. So really love love what you all are doing. And thank you again to the audience for being with us. Uh, looking forward to the next one. Uh, feel free to uh, send us messages. We have of social media where you can uh, definitely reach out, uh, give us feedback on the event, uh, recommend other speakers you'd want to hear from. Um, we really want to highlight the wonderful work Kiwis are doing in the US and bring a strong partnership between Kiwis in New Zealand and Kiwis in the US. That's the whole point of this. So um, feel free to give us feedback, anything we can do to improve. Uh, we have our social media networks totally open to you. So thank you again um, and have a wonderful rest of your day in different time zones that everyone's in. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Kia kā. Yeah. Thanks all. Thanks everybody for doing it. Thanks everybody for coming online.